So I'm going to go ahead and get this started. Um, I want to welcome you to this Y to Y sponsored event. Um, the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, or Y to Y, is about connecting and protecting this region all the way from below Wyoming or into Wyoming all the way up to the Arctic Refuge, so that both people and nature can thrive. The Y to Y region overlaps with at least 75 Indigenous territories. The head office sits on the traditional territory of the Stony Sutina, Blackfeet, Tanaha, Swetmuk, and Zone 3 of the Metis, who are the traditional stewards of the, this land. And for that, we thank them. Um, I want to remind people that this is part of a loose knit um, set of dialogues. In fact, it's the fourth dialogue on transboundary conservation. And the first dialogue came about when we started to hear from the two federal governments in the United States and Canada that there was an interest in working together. And we decided that we would just invite anyone who was interested. And in this particular dialogue, there's now 150 people signed up. So I'm really pleased for the incredible energy around this um, to, to, to talk about what is really needed, what's going on and what would help some of the big visions that are have long been getting worked on. Norma, I know you've been working for uh, 27 years on transboundary conservation. Um, what do we need to, to get to, to realization of these visions? Um, so today um, I will shortly introduce the panelists, uh, five indigenous people who live in territories that the Y2Y uh, region overlaps. <sighs> overlapping territories, lines on maps. This is sort of one of the purposes of the dialogue. I moved from Bozeman, Montana and expanded my family's home range to Alberta about six years ago. Um, and at that time there was an election in the United States and there was lots of talks about borders and walls. And at one point, there was even a discussion about a wall between Canada and the US and my then 10 year old daughter had heard about this and she came running home and she said, but mama, mama, what will the animals do? At which point my then seven year old daughter said, but mama, mama, how will we ever get back to Montana? Kids are wise. I also wanna share with you that I went to my very first international Peace Park meeting at the very first international peace park in the world, which is Glacier National Park in the United States and Waterton Lakes National Park in Canada. And I didn't know a lot about peace parks, but I want to share with you one thing that I learned that I really hold close with me, which is that there's, it's not just peace, there's actually negative peace and there's positive peace. And what I learned is that negative peace is simply the absence of conflict. Whereas positive peace is the act of building goodwill across boundaries. And I think that that's another theme that we're gonna hear from these panelists. So very briefly, the structure is each individual panelist will be given time to just give some context about what they have been spending their life work on in this transboundary world and their vision. After that, um, they'll be all sitting on a panel uh, for discussions. You all who are listening to this, please use the question and answer. Please don't use the chat, particularly because I'll explain it in a second, but use the question and answer. I will pull from those questions as well as encouraging dialogue among the panelists to go deeper on particular issues. Um, and, um, and we'll go from there. This dialogue is being recorded uh, because it, it uh, one, there has been a lot of requests for people who were either floating rivers or out in the bush or whatever who wanted to hear of the wisdom of this group. And two, groups like the Canadian Mountain Network and others might be able to incorporate it into their work so that we can continue to learn from this dialogue into the future. So at this point, I would be introducing Eli Enns, and I want to take a moment. He had a really serious family emergency that I learned about a half an hour ago. And so I'm very sorry that he won't be there. And I am going, I'm a very poor stand-in for this, but I am going to do my very best 
um, to uh, channel at all things Eli and facilitate this group. So, um, I guess one thing that I want to say that would be uh, that Eli, I think, would say is that we talk about borders, um, borders that are relatively recent borders, like the United States and Canada creating this border. And, um, and it's really quite an artificial boundary. We know that both peoples and wildlife um, have long roamed more widely uh, and uh, not recognize these borders. And so they're uh, of recent making and they create some different kinds of problems. And I think that we're gonna find from this panel that there's some really incredible ways to move forward to solve some of the issues that these uh, create. So um, we have sent out bios of each of the speakers and I want you to know they're incredible people with an incredible depth of knowledge and years and years of work. I'm not going to reintroduce the speakers in part because I just became the, the, the facilitator, but also in part because they're gonna speak a little bit about themselves um, and you can look them up and I want you to hear from them. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start off with Norma. And Norma, I will share your um, uh, map here as well. Uh, okay. So I just get started? Yes, over to you. Dren Quinzi, Shalak Nai, Jat Nokwadi, D, and Jit Shitri, Fairju, Nokwats, Height Nathan, Nokwatsi, Nokwatsu, Nokwento, Kai, Kakwa, that Shitri, Goods at Height No Jitnu. We always have to, when we speak about our caribou and our homelands, we always have to acknowledge the ancestors that we got our wisdom from that started us started out with us on this on this journey to to, uh, to protect our caribou and um, and and a lot of the ancestors are very young too that were with us and uh, and they broke trail for us they broke this trail for us and they're guiding us every day as we do this work they're always beside us so I just want to acknowledge them I was really fortunate to be born into my community when when it was really traditional and our culture really strong and intact and where only my language was spoken. Um, is my name and uh, the one who gives away their last cup of tea. I'm Chicha, I'm um, related to the wolf. And I'm Bantad Gujin, we're people of the lakes and my nation and my relatives of Gujin people extend into Alaska, North Yukon, Old Crow, and into the Northwest Territories. I was born in a Klavik Northwest Territories and raised in Old Crow Flats. My relatives, the Guchin, extends into Alaska, North Yukon, Old Crow, and into the NP. My, a bit of my story, um, where I grew up, there's thousands of lakes all interconnected somehow to each other. All we are, but they called it North America's second biggest wetland. This is my home and it's a very beautiful place. My grandfather carried me all over on his back, all over the place and taught me about every living thing, about the birds, the plants, all our surroundings, the sacredness of all of them and the insects. And only in my language, I was raised in my language. So in May, thousands of birds would come from all over the world. And I heard they later they came from places like Chesapeake Bay, Hawaii, Chile, Argentina, and they come from all outside is what I learned. And then there's 200 species of them that come to honor us and they have their young ones in the wetlands around us, around where we walk, around where we trap and hunt, they are there and they, they honor us with their, their young ones. And, um, and I was also uh, very, that we were raised very close to the land and only our natural laws governed us, no one else, no one else is around. We just had the natural laws to govern us. And, um, and everything like the, where the wind blows, the kinds of snow, the snow piles, that, that how it piles is important, what kinds, and then we had, um, the sun was our clock. 
um, 24 hours of it. And the way we communicated with the, with the animals in our languages straight up was, uh, is the way I was raised. We were secure, there was no fear. We lived in harmony with our surroundings and respected the, the lessons. Um, one of the most important is when the caribou comes in May. They walk by our tent in our camp and they sleep on the, on the, on the lakes. The pregnant cows, like hundreds of them, would come to our big lake there called Zelma Lake and it's full of muskrat push-ups. And they all come there and they eat what the muskrat pulls up for them and they, they, um, they eat this stuff from under the lake and, and the muskrats bring up for them and the cows would just go to sleep and we just pray for them in ceremony, do ceremonies. We're so happy to see them. And we'd be really quiet so that they could have a rest because they got 200 kilometers to go yet to around uh, on, in the migratory route up to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and back. And, um, it, and it's like clockwork in June, in the calving grounds um, in the Arctic Refuge, 40,000 calves are born in northeastern Alaska, and it's on the, uh, the coastal plain. And then they make their way back in August and September, and, um, and, the, and the young bulls and that, that um, break the trail, they begin to come through to our communities in the fall time. And, and just last few days, my boys got three. We were blessed with three caribou. So very happy about that. And the, the cycle continues, but now in a very different way. And as you know, the porcupine caribou herd is the largest migrating barren ground caribou left on the planet. And uh, we care for them deeply. We spiritualize with them. We are interconnected in, in, with our entire existence. Our people fought many years to protect our homelands, our caribou. In the decades after World War II, a series of mega projects, including dams, pipelines, and oil drilling threaten to disrupt our ecological systems and disentangle the fabric of our Kuchin life. Ancestors kicked them out of our pro flats. They literally kicked them out, told them to leave, like get out. And uh, we fought hard, to our ancestors fought hard to protect that. From Alaska to the Yukon to Northwest Territories, the Kuchin battled against these projects, fighting to safeguard the habitats of the caribou and other, other creatures struggling to maintain the shared interconnected that interconnection that we have with those animals and humans and um, the ongoing campaign to protect the arctic refuge represents the most widely known example of this longer history of which in advocacy when judge berger many of you know judge berger visited old crow in 1975 during the mckenzie valley pipeline inquiry he learned that the whole village my village was opposed to the pipeline he heard from 81 people, 81 people had testified. He said virtually every, everyone, man, woman, young and old spoke and they spoke with one voice. The people told him about the Kuchin connection to the caribou, the mainstay of their life and their culture for thousands of years. Based on what he heard in the village, village after village throughout Northern Canada and the Western Canada, Berger called for a 10 year moratorium on the Mackenzie Valley pipeline until land claims were settled within Northern indigenous, with, within the Northern regions of indigenous peoples. He be, became really concerned about our caribou. The powerful testimony given to him from Old Crow and the communities convinced him that the herd was integral to the way of life. And I quote, destruction of the porcupine caribou herd would mean in its turn, destruction of the subsistence economies of the native villages on both sides of the international boundary, he argued. Since the herd calves in the coastal plain and stretches from Alaska to Yukon, Berger urged that this area receive permanent protection. And then, and then on and on to the Inuvialuit final agreement in 1984, the Inuvialuit final agreement created the North Yukon National Park with rights to hunt, fish, and trap within that park. This changed the park status in this country. But then, then the Van Tepuchin followed. Immediately after that, Van Tepuchin First Nation final agreement signed in 1993, like the Inuvialuit, 
This agreement included provisions to establish a national park. Now it's called the Vantech National Park. Both are connected on that, this side, on the Canada side. In 1985, the Yukon Territorial Elections, we, we all ran, a bunch of us natives ran, our indigenous people from throughout the Yukon ran in this election, and we overturned a 30-year conservative regime in the Yukon to a majority of indigenous NDP government led under government Tony Pennicott at the time, and I became an MLA representing Vantat. And it was a good thing too, it was timely too because of the issue. And my Cascadene colleague mentor, Dave Porter, became our Minister of Renewable Resources, immediately worked to implement the Por Porcupine Caribou Management Agreement and the board that was established representing all which in users, commu user communities on the Canada side. Soon after that, the international, in 1987, the International Porcupine Caribou Management Agreement between the United States and Canada was established. So major portions of Canada side and the migratory routes on this side are protected. The question is now, what do we do with Alaska? In 1987, Ronald Reagan opened the calving grounds for the development. And of course, we, we were charged up. We were going to fight. We were devastated, but we, were gonna, we, we, had to, we had to group up and create action. And Jonathan, in 1998, Jonathan Solomon our Gucin, and our Gucin leaders um, got together and created a, a action gathering of our people um, into the nearest community in the calving grounds. We called it the Guchin uh, gathering of the peoples, rebirth. This was a rebirth of our nation. And uh, the gathering took place there and uh, hundreds of people came from uh, Beaver, Birch Creek, Chalkitsik Circle, Eagle, Fort Yukon, Stevens Village, Vini Pai, Eklavik, Inuvik, Sigachik, Old Crow, and Inupiaq joined us, the Thompson family joined us uh, from Inupiaq Village. And, uh, and that made us really, really strong and going forward in our, in our plight. So we had six days of dialogue, catching up family reunions, stories of our history and what we went through as a nation and the tolls of the colonial border that was put between us. It was devastating for us because we couldn't no longer share food with each other amongst our village between, between Alaska and Canada, which is but we continue to, we, we did everything we can to bring salmon and trade caribou and moose with, uh, with Kuchin village down, village down in Fort Yukon from Old Crow. We had to do that because many times, sometimes caribou didn't come to our village or we salmon is, is scarce sometimes over the years. So we, we continue that today. They wouldn't stop us. Um, many elders at that time spoke with a, with a talking stick. Lots of them are gone now and that's why I opened with acknowledging them. They spoke in only our language. They threw out an agenda that the environmentalists brought in and they threw that out. And we went into a big circle and talked for six days. And we listened to our stories of the history of the Kuchin. They armed us with every knowledge that they could think of that we needed. And the chiefs and the elders, they met up the hill by Trimble Gilbert's house. They made fire and had tea and they were gone for a long time. They were developing a strategy for us. And uh, when they finally came back, they came, we just surrounded them in the hall and it was just full. And the strategy was go home, gather locally, then go to your nation, talk on radios and everything, hold meetings and talk to the governments, the state of Alaska, the Yukon territorial government, the GNWT, and then go nationally and make sure that your prime ministers and your top leaders all know about the Kuchin way of life. Well, I'm just like halfway through. <laughs> okay, so um, then we go to Washington and then when you're armed, go to Washington DC and, uh, and do your work in a good way. And you are to mentor youth all along the way at, so that they can take your place when they get tired. So there was two resolutions. One was to declare the opposition to oil drilling and grant wilderness status to the Arctic Coastal Plain. And the second was to create the Guchin Steering Committee and that, led, that was led and guided by Jonathan Solomon, Sarah James, Johnny Charlie, and Alice Frost. Those were our guides. And the Guchin on both sides of the border became the transnational political advocacy group with positions evenly divided between Alaska and Canadian communities. 
And I was honored to have been a part of that incredible group. So I just wanted to bring your uh, knowledge to the, the map and then I'll be done. Um, the Guchin call this place wilderness designation, but really it's our human rights and our right to live and continue our cultural ways of life in that, in that Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So the map was created by the Guchin Steering Committee and it may look like just another map, map, a dotted line in the middle is the border. It's the arbitrary least important one. Then you look in, you look instead to the two curvy lines around that loop around much of the area. Those tell the map's true story. The dark lines are the trans, transnational range of the caribou. The lighter are the homelands of the which in uh, repeatedly intersecting and marrying one mirror, marrying one another. And the overlapping lines show how Guchin communities are situated along the herd's route. This translate our struggle, making our strong argument for our interconnections. I can wait there, I have more, but I can enter, talk more in dialogue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Norma. That's an incredible <laughs> amount of history that somehow you got into a short period of time. I appreciate that. Carlin, uh, would you like to speak next? And remember to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Jody. Thank you, everyone. My name is Carlin Itchak. Ariga wanga nagayak itchuakak sitnesuakmun apaga Wilbur itchuakak utkayagwikmun akaga. Kora Ichuagak Utkayaga Wikmun Savaktunga Anchorage Me. My Inupiak name is Nagayak Ichuagak. Nagayak means fish bait. Ichuagak means to peek around the corner. And I'm the Alaska State Director for the Wilderness Society. I'm here in Anchorage on the unceded territory of the Denina people. My grandfather is Wilbur Ichak. Ichuahak from Barrow, and my grandmother is Cora. On my mother's side is Norman and Margaret Irvin from the Mohawk River area in Schenectady, New York. I'm not sure if you can see me. I can't see you, but uh, yeah. I, I just want to uh, thank you uh, Jody for having me today and thank the panelists for allowing me to share this space with you. Uh, we send our well wishes, our thoughts and prayers to Eli and his family, and especially want to thank you and welcome all of the participants for being here today. Uh, these are challenging times and there's a lot going on, so thank you for joining us. As the Alaska State Director for the Wilderness Society, uh, we're an organization that was founded in 1935 by some amazing conservationists who helped shape a lot of the wilderness areas and protections that we see here in the lower 48 and the United States today. Uh, we have quite a legacy uh, to uphold in terms of uh, what our founders have done. And as an Anupiaq man coming from Nome, Alaska, where I was born and raised, and growing up whale hunting in Barrow with my relatives and my uncles, I remember my uncle Wilbur and my uncle James Nakayak teaching me that the bowhead whales have us, everything has a spirit, and the whales have a spirit. And when we go out and hunt, we don't catch whales or caribou or seals or walrus or anything else, we don't catch them because we're skilled hunters and we don't kill them because we, when, they, when we catch them they, and they stop breathing, their spirit is still alive. So we don't say we kill something. And we don't catch them because we're skilled hunters. We catch them because they gave themselves to us. The whales will know how the village or the hunters and the elders and the people in the village treated them. And if they're treated with respect and they're shared and taken care of and given to people that can't hunt for themselves, shared with the elderly and with others, 
across boundaries. The elders would give the whale water so the spirits had enough strength to go back to the water and tell the other whales how it was treated. And if we treated them well, they'll come back the next year and give themselves to us again. And the next year and the next year. And the same with the caribou. You hear from Norma and, and the Gwich'in how humans became caribou. In the north, you hear how we became polar bear or polar bear became us. We all have those trans, transitional stories and we all have these traditional rules and ways of gathering, which unfortunately we call subsistence today, which doesn't even come close to explain the wholeness behind what we're doing and what, what we've learned from our ancestors. And so I came to the Wilderness Society maybe as the only conservationist who's harpooned a whale, I don't know. But I had these different worldviews that I grew up with, a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at things. And in my interview process, I talked about decolonizing conservation and indigenizing conservation. What did I mean by that? In my mind, we had all this land that is now public land across the United States and in Alaska that was previously indigenous land. I attend all these meetings every day where we have these land acknowledgements and we rightfully and purposefully acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of indigenous people. Not one person in any of our meetings can get on a meeting and say they're not on indigenous lands. And so I wanted to make it my mission to try to look at land protections through an indigenous worldview. And the Wilderness Society agreed with me and hired me anyway. And so here I am. And with the great support of Peter Engst, my supervisor, and the great leadership of Jamie Williams, our president, and our governing council, and many funders, some of the donors and funders who made the Imago Initiative possible are on here but also the indigenous partners and conservation partners who've teamed up with us to help create the Imago Initiative. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit the Arctic Refuge, let me tell you, it, it's a place like no other. You can fly for hours and hours and never leave its splendor, as Norma was explaining. You can see one of the last intact Arctic ecosystems in the United States. There you'll find the porcupine caribou herd, some of the last polar bear habitat in the US. Thousands of birds that migrate to all 50 states come to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Numerous fish, wolves, wolverine, doll sheep, enormous, enormous grizzly bears. The list goes on and on, not, not even to mention the flora and fauna beyond what I've described. But the refuge is more than about its wildlife. It's actually most important because of the people who have a spiritual and life-giving connection to the special and sacred place, a place many indigenous people still call home. With the Imago Initiative, we seek to bring Inupiaq and Quich in together with our conservation partners in an attempt to heal historical trauma associated with the dispossession of land and culture through rapid assimilation and termination laws and policies, and to build trust and explore new possibilities for indigenous led land protections and management that would contribute to a just and sustainable rural economy. We also aim to extend the healing and trust building to include conservation and agency partners. The Imago Initiative was named after imaginal cells that exist in a caterpillar that allows it to transform into a butterfly. And this was a beautiful analogy I heard from our well-known indigenous leader in Minnesota, Winona LaDuke, when she was speaking at a Just Transition Conference in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I was inspired by this. It is an on the ground investment in inclusivity and equity, one that would re-envision how protected areas are designed, how conservation is accomplished, who it benefits, and we believe that we must pivot the focus and approach of our proactive long-term goal of permanent protection of the coastal plain and beyond. We must look at land protections through an indigenous worldview. 
And the example I gave you with whale hunting is only an infinitesimal small part of that. There are so many important worldviews that we would like to capture and promulgate into new protections. By making protected areas more durable, recognizing the rights of indigenous inhabitants and providing fair and equitable benefits for Nupiak and Gwich'in people alike, we could help set a transformational example for the conservation movement in Alaska and nationally and help advance social justice for indigenous communities. In fact, we wouldn't be able to do this project if it wasn't for the internal diversity, equity, and inclusion work at TWS. The Imago Initiative, in my view, is a outward manifestation of that important work internally. The goals are simple, to identify the wrongs of the past and to make them right in the future, but the task is inherently complicated. We are recognizing the harms of the past related to taking land from indigenous people for public use without their knowledge, their free prior and informed consent or their permission. And we're working on healing from the trauma associated with assimilation and termination policies. And we're trying to move forward as Sarah James always reminds us, move forward in a good way. And Many Inupiaq people have viewed the refuge designation and its management as curtailing their ancestral rights and traditional use of the land. Whereas the Gwich'in have been united in protecting the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for many years, as we heard, heard from Norma, I have that amazing resolution that Norma mentioned hanging on my wall in my office as a reminder every day that we can do this and we can get it right. And so, we must be looking at alternative public land protections that respects the sovereignty and self-determination of the indigenous people and our rights, while at the same time be careful not to diminish our current defense efforts. The wonderful work that Bernadette Dementif and the Gwich'in Steering Commun Committee and others are doing uh, to protect the refuge. So we're working on a paradigm shift uh, with our conservation partners and we're open to the idea of moving forward from an exclusionary uninhabited national, national parks and wilderness to new kind of protected areas. On December 17, 1971, indigenous people in Alaska owned or had Aboriginal title to the land of 300 million acres. On December 18th, a day later, we held title to 44 million acres. And our concept of land ownership is different than the Western worldview. The land doesn't belong to us, we belong to the land. We wanna take some of those indigenous worldviews and incorporate them into the conservation movement and to start looking at conservation through an indigenous worldview. And we believe it's important to do that with place-based dialogue on the land with our partners, listening to our elders and young people and our partners to brainstorm new ideas and to come up with with new ways of protecting the land. So thank you for your time. A lot to think about there, Carlin, thank you. Mita, over to you and please do remember to introduce yourself. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, I just wanted a quick check-in. How are we on time? When should I be able to transition? You are good on time. I will let you know when there's three minutes left. So you have 12 minutes. Perfect. Le ka klenach, me to do it. You cut door sock, sling it klenach, the zinach, you cut door sock, nanya ina hatsati, kachari yari hatsati, stakin kwan aya hut. My clinket names are Tsetinach and Kat Klot. My adopted Inupiaq name from Kaktovik from Marianne Warden is to giggle look. And my adopted Northern Cree name from Harry Watchmaker is Boss Eagle Spirit Woman. Uh, my English name is Mita DeWitt, and I am living on the unceded territories of the Denaina people in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I'm here with my fiance, and together combined, we have eight children. Um, so it's always busy and always fun, and lots of imagination. Uh, thank you, Carlin, for introducing the Imago Initiative and for imparting 
the humanity of the Nabak in the story. I always am thankful for that. Um, the story is, is older than we are, right? The story goes even before contact. The story goes into our relationship with the land and who we are as indigenous people. Also these relationships that we're talking about are our trade partners, our relatives, our cousins, and how we view the world. And in this process, I think it's very important that I discussed uh, my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother was Marion Paul and her father was Louis Paul, his brother was William Paul. Uh, her grandfather was uh, Chief Shakes the Seventh, Charlie Jones, and her grandmother was also Tilly Paul Tamari. And the reason that this is important uh, in this context is because the that realization of colonization and the loss of land was not lost on our ancestors, and they did incredible amounts of work to retain who they were, as well as um, coming into this space and working to be seen as humans. You know, Chief Shakes was uh, arrested for voting and Tilly Paul Temery stood with him and she was the first Alaska Native missionary and helped to start the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood. And they stood their ground and it did go to court and they're represented by William Paul. And William Paul, he won that case by proving that Chief Shakes was civilized, but they call it the toilet paper defense because in that one of the defenses they used was that uh, he used indoor plumbing. And they had to work every step of the way and dedicate their entire lives for gaining rights and access to these political systems. And from there, William Paul worked on Alaska Native land claims, the Teton case. And he worked with Etuk and he worked with the um, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in its beginning. And at the end, my grandmother, her stories, she tells me at the end, they said that they gave up too much in the fight to be recognized as civilized, to gain their rights to vote and to be incorporated into America. They gave up too much of their culture and too much of themselves. And she said, for, for me and our generation, we have to go out and enjoy being native. And so what is it to enjoy being native? What is our story? Our story is to be real human beings, to being in relationship with the land, being in relationship with each other, to being caretakers. Right. And our predecessors, you know, our ancestral stories, they tell us of these coming times and how they're going to change. Our relationship at contact changed with the land. And that through these changes, the way that we're going to survive is by taking care of each other and taking care of the land and our relatives, uh, meaning the animals and the fish and the birds. And so these principles are deep set values that Western systems didn't inherently bring in with them when they came into America. And with the Imago Initiative, we're looking at that reimagining what does conservation look like in an indigenous lens, right? And what does it mean to be a real human being? And bringing forth these concepts of it's all of our rights as humans to be in relationship and to care for each other and to live well. And we're not separate from the earth, but we're part of the earth and really coming into this space as uh, servant leaders or dedicated to the people and helping to elevate those traditional stories and who we are into these spaces. And so we've been imparting the indigenous facilitation methods into our structure and the way that we're bringing people together. 
And here recently, just this summer, we brought eight people into the Arctic Refuge based on this indigenous facilitation methodology and creating relationship. And we came together to connect with each other and to brainstorm on public land protections through an indigenous worldview, new protections that honor sovereignty and self-determination and benefit indigenous people as well as the public. And we wanted to really um, not put parameters and hyper agenda structures, you know, we heard earlier from Norma that they threw out that agenda, right? <laughs> and so when we came into this space, we had to first function as a community and create trust relationships because we had Anupak people, we had Gwich'in people, we had conservation, we had um, people of you know, BIPOC representation, and we wanted to create this space of relationships with each other. And so in our talking circles, you know, the first round is about introduction and getting to know who each other are. The second round is about the topic, right? Why, why are we coming together on this conversation? And then the third round is what do we do about it? And so really allowing that space to kind of unpack and decompress, you know, Carlin always talks about the, um, detoxing from the Western world and blue light and blue screens. And so those first couple of days is about just being human, eating together, right? Having this communal space together, uh, working in cooperation with each other and learning who each other are. And I'm actually gonna um, show a couple of pictures because I, I feel that it's important. Can you see my screen okay? So as we are sitting together, this is our group of 22 people. It's actually the largest group of people who've gone into the Arctic Refuge. And we made sure to work with the Gwich'in people and gain permissions to go in. And we were out of the caribou calving grounds. We were in the mountains. So we are far enough away to maintain those sacred protocols with, with the people. And we gathered in this space without any Wi-Fi, without any cell service, and really with the intention of becoming good allies and to witness you know, this beauty of mother nature and not just creating the relationship between each other, but re like reconnecting and creating the relationship with us and the earth because the earth is a sovereign living being. I could watch those guys all day, but let's go to the next one. And really allowing our elders to tell us the story of who we are and where we come from, right? Why are we here? Why are we doing this? And where are we going? Because our elders are our, our guides. There are voices from our ancestors. And listening to even the smallest relatives in nature and the lessons that they have to teach us and show us and taking that time just to be present and witness. I'm just, I'm showing pictures. So I'm gonna get through all of these <laughs> words. We also took the time to go through ceremony. So in, you know, Guchin way and in the back way, being respectful of each protocol. When people came in, we smudged and we made offerings to the grounds, to the earth, to have us there and to help us to understand the way forward and really taking that time to do it in a good way. And we did have a talking stick that we used for each one of our most important conversations throughout our time together. And this group, they were, they came with a real intention, uh, authenticity, because this story that we have in transitioning into our future is our human story. And according to our traditional elders, we have to bring our traditional ecological knowledge and worldview and the best of what the Western systems have to offer to work together to move forward in a good way. And that's really what this is about is um, helping all of us to become real humans again. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. There's lots of great pictures. We could get lost in all of the amazing pictures. 
But um, with our Imago initiative, we have people who meet on a regular basis, our task force who are our teachers and help us to create this vision as we're working together. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about Carlin is he didn't come in and tell us what we were going to do or think. He came in to hold space so that way the indigenous people could have their voices elevated and work together as a group. Because we know that we work together better in partnership and in re as relatives. And we also have honored spirit in this process and listening to our ancestors and really, you know, native way, if things are working out, even if you didn't intend them to and as much planning as you did and something changes, but it's better, like that's your grandparents and great grandparents looking after you. And it's really having that space of that happening. You know, there's so much to this world that we don't understand. And um, one of the, even just the simple thing about being on here with the folks from Montana, we know that we're related to each other, our old trade routes and stories. Uh, there's one time I went to teach about, I'm a plants educator, a, a ethno herbalist is a traditional healer is actually what I do. And I was in Montana and Browning and I was teaching with kids in a summer youth camp. And I had a moment where I'm like, why? I'm Clinket. Why am I down here in Browning teaching you know, Blackfeet kids? I enjoyed it and I loved it. And I, but I just, I didn't quite understand like what, why spirit had brought me there. And then one of the aunties came and she said, you see these kids? A lot of these children are part Clinket. She said in the, in the big scoop, they took Clinket children from Southeast and took them down to Montana. And they took a bunch of Blackfeet children up into Southeast. And I called one of my elders afterwards and asked, and they said, yes, that happened. We have Blackfeet people up here who, and we have our Clinket children that we lost down there. And so spirit brought me down there, you know, to, to help share part of culture and story, and also to help understand this interconnected and, um, honoring each other for who we are and where we come from is part of that healing process and removing that shame of the historical trauma because it wasn't our fault. And we have to remove that mantle and move forward in um, this beautiful spirit that we are that has been given to us by our elders. So I'm gonna end a little bit, little bit early but I think that this connectivity is powerful because it's coming back to who we are as indigenous people and working together. Another wonderful perspective and um, a lot to chew on. So now we've had a little bit of a, what I would call like rapid succession of what's happening in the northern reaches where the porcupine caribou wander. And we're gonna wander a little bit further south to uh, focus on Buffalo and the Blackfoot Confederacy. So Leroy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You'll need to turn on your microphone and please do remember to introduce yourself. Okay, Nisto Nakok, Ikas Kinewa. He knocks it, can now. So keep up here. Can I know to sit up here? My Blackfoot name is Lokorn. I'm of the Small Robes clan. I belong to Kana, our tribe, and we're of the Blackfoot uh, Confederacy. My English name, of course, is Leroy Little Bear. And I've been long associated with the University of Lethbridge here in uh, Southern Alberta. I 
This is the song that belongs to the uh, Buffalo Treaty. We gave that song to our working group that worked on the uh, Buffalo Treaty. So that you understand what these songs are all about, they are a synchronization of all the sounds in the environment, so on. And they become vocal art. And that's what these songs and so on. Most people just refer to them as chants, but they're much more than that. As I said, they are a synchronization of all the sounds that you hear out in your territory, and in this case, Blackfoot territory. Let me preface what some of the ideas I'm gonna share with you with the following. I was teaching a course over in Winnipeg a few years ago, about four or five years ago, and there was an Aborigine student from Australia that was in the class. And as part of the discussion that was going on, I mean, you know, we, we were talking about native worldviews. I was teaching a native philosophy course. She she told me and told the class the following. Now, how true it is and to what extent and scope the thing she told me is, I don't know. I've never had the opportunity to go and find out. So I'm just going by what she told me. Here's what she said. And I'm, of course, paraphrasing. She said there was a, a tribe, a small tribe of Aborigines in Western Australia that had decided as a group not to have any more babies, not to have any more kids. And by not having any more kids, they were just going to simply fade out, slow but sure, as their elders and people pass on. And the reason they were doing that was because they came to the conclusion that modern development, industrial development, you know, mining and so forth, explorations, et cetera, for resources and so on, had so interfered with who they are and with the land that they couldn't really continue to be who they are. In other words, the land that they used to re, you know, relate to has totally changed and they could not really be themselves culturally anymore. So keep that in mind. As you know, I'd like to take the big picture, you know, global picture. And that is our brothers 
all those other animals, the plant life, even the rocks and so on, the cosmos and so forth, that we grow up in, a society, however that society comes into existence, sooner or later through that mutual relationship to the totality of the environment, we claim a territory because we get to know all the relational networks within that territory and so on. And it is from that relationship that what we refer to as a culture develops. And a culture usually has an esoteric, if you want to say theoretical aspect to it. It has customs. The, you know, customs are the accepted ways of doing things. And it has values. Values are the standards that you know, the society, the societal members are expected to follow. Social values are also incentives that the societal members are expected to reach for, you know, and always reach for as goals, so on. The, the esoteric esoteric part of it, the theoretical part, if you want to call it paradigms and metaphysics, they're the belief system, they're the ways that we look at the, the uh, reality out there. In other words, everything that comes to me through and I through my uh, sensory intake, whether it's sight, whether it's hearing, whether it's taste and so on. Hey, that's what, you know, I use those metaphysics that have developed to interpret everything out there. Okay. Well, guess what? I would, would think that those animals, and in our case, the buffalo, also have those kind of metaphysics, ways of interpreting, and so on. They also claim territory. In other words, all animals usually have a territory, hunting territories, and so forth. See? And what has happened is that we as humans have come on, I should say, we used to be part of that larger circle that our elders refer to as all my relations. All my relations, of course, are all those trees out there those birds, those fish, you know, those buffalo and so on, the cosmos, the stars, in other words, everything that comes into contact with me are all my relations. See? And we, as humans, we used to be part of that relational network. But it seems that we're increasingly removing ourselves out of that circle and we're trying to control it. So, well, if we come back to the notion of territory, hey, we're trying to control that territory by crisscrossing those territories of those animals, of all our relations with human-made boundaries. Well, think about it. 
COVID-19, for instance, we're all aware of it, doesn't respect boundaries. See, those animal brothers and sisters don't respect boundaries. See, hey, the wind doesn't respect boundaries. If you want to look at it from an economic perspective, hey, those corporations don't respect boundaries. See? Even in our treaty relationships, hey, the Blackfoot, for instance, all of the Blackfoot tribe, the Blackfoot Confederacy signed a treaty with the United States. See? Well, the latest aspect of that transboundary notion is the Buffalo Treaty that has been signed by tribes on both sides of the border. Say, well, when we're talking about conservation, it seems like we're always talking about it from outside that circle. See? And those boundaries always coming in, into existence. We start talking about jurisdiction and so forth. See? When in reality, the kind of territories we want to have and that I've heard it just in these presentations and really appreciate are those boundaries that are brothers and sisters, whether they're the caribou, whether they're the bears, the grizzly bears, the buffalo and so on. Those territories that they have that we have to be aware of and that our human-made boundaries have, you know, cut across. See? And consequently, yes, if we're going to be true conservationists, we are going to have to have a paradigm shift. Let me give you a couple examples of paradigm shift, one you've already heard of, and that is that caterpillar that transforms into a butterfly. What a beautiful shift. A whole new, a whole new world, a whole new way of looking at things from crawling to flying very different way of seeing the world after that shift takes place. I can't, I can't remember who it was, but if my memory serves me right, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt that came up with the saying, Give me simplicity on the other side of complexity. Well, if we were able to cross over from complexity over to simplicity, that would be an example of a paradigm shift. So, so it's not impossible from our present and dominant conservation approaches, we need to stop and reflect. Here in Canada, Truth and Reconciliation Commission gave the country an opportunity to stop and reflect about its relationship to 
First Peoples, to First Nations. Well, COVID-19 is giving us that opportunity to stop and reflect. We should take advantage of that. And if we do that reflection, it'll be much easier to see the beauty of making those paradigm shifts. So when we're looking at Buffalo, we're talking about Buffalo coming across the US-Canada border, letting them be free on both sides, back and forth. That was the view and dream of our elders, you know, to see free roaming buffalo again. Why? Well, because that buffalo is such an important part of the land. It is an eco engineer. It keeps an eco balance. And we're part of that eco balance. And it's also a keystone species when it comes to our culture, because our songs, our stories, our ceremonies are connected to that buffalo. Without it, just like those Aborigines, hey, maybe we, we wouldn't be anymore. So that's why it's very important to let the buffalo be buffalo. And for us humans not to interfere in their territory, so to speak, by putting artificial boundaries on their territory. So another thought that I would just leave with you is we live in a very narrow gap of ideal conditions for us as humans to exist. If you start playing around with those ideal conditions, we will go the way of Neanderthal man. Say, we used to text him, as I jokingly say, he used to be, we used to be neighbors with him a few thousand years ago. But where is he now? Say, and scientists are already saying the new species, in other words, talking about who's going to replace us. So if we're going to last into the future, then we need to retain all those ecological balances that the caribou, the fish, the buffalo, the plants, and so on bring about. Because for every species, whether they're plants or animals that disappear, we also begin to disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy, a lot in what you said. I really appreciate the, the depth and breadth of knowledge. Terry, uh, over to you, and, and um, please do remember to introduce yourself. Okay. My Blackfeet name is Crow Tail Feathers. My English name is Terry Katzi. And uh, I just want to show my background here. Up to my right shoulder is my mother and her, uh, her parents. And to my left is my dad and his, uh, his parents. My children are 
behind me and my grandparents, grandchildren are, are in back of me. And so when I speak in front of when I, uh, these types of settings, I like to use that as my backdrop because I, I bring the, the responsibilities and the knowledge and, and understandings that I was taught by both my grandparents and my parents. And that responsibility that I have today is to teach my children and my grandchildren to continue the ways that I was uh, taught by my, my uh, elders. And so I wanna start with that. And my story is not a whole lot different from some of the uh, other presenters who did an excellent job, I might add. And I always uh, enjoy following Leroy, but I also don't like to follow Leroy because he's such a, has so much depth and experience and knowledge. But my, what I'm going to share with you comes from my experience of, of growing up here on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in North Central Montana, born and raised here. I was taught by both my uh, grandfathers and grandmothers about gathering, hunting in the responsible way that uh, they did it and uh, the offerings and things that you had to do, the protocols you had to follow to uh, before you harvested things. There's a lot of responsibility with that. And so I, I learned that as a young boy growing up here, then uh, went on through the school systems and, and uh, really gravitated back to the, the ways of my upbringing in staying within the, uh, the world that I was raised in from hunting and gathering to, uh, to um, the relationships that we have with our, with our, um, our brothers and sisters in, in the mountains. But one of the things that always came out from my grandparents' teachings is our travel. And our travel was always related to the buffalo and, and the other animals and the plants that we utilize for, for our, our ways. And some of their stories took, uh, took us across the state of Montana, of course, into Wyoming. And some other stories took us into uh, New Mexico and Mexico. And those stories were always intriguing to me because one of the things they talked about was the allies and alliances that we had built all the way to Mexico and some of the trade that took place. And so that was something that I always remember. And as kind of fast forward into 1993, uh, before I go start there, I want to share that both my grandparents on my maternal, maternal side uh, lived on this reservation too that was established in 1873. And when they established this reservation, they built a fence around it. And our people could no longer go to these areas that uh, was part of indigenous homelands. And so they had, in order to, for them to go visit some of these places, they had to get a pass from the agent to leave the reservation. There was a lot of trauma then because uh, some of the their grandparents had gone through the Bear River Massacre. And so a lot of those stories of oppression were, were real and, and hard with them at that time. So they, they didn't like to leave beyond that reservation boundary fence. And so, um, so fast forward when I went to work for the Black Peak Community College in 1993, we started to revisit some of these places of importance to us that our, that our people talked about in their stories. In the, in the latter part of the 1990s, we started taking a lot of our elders at that time to places of really culturally significant importance and very sacred to us. And that was the Sweet Grass Hills that was down by uh, Great Falls and those areas in parts of uh, the three forts of Montana. And when we started when we took our first uh, group of elders down to the Sweetgrass Hills, probably around 1998 or 1999, uh, a lot of our elders at that time were just amazed. They talked, my sister was the president of our community college at the time, and they told her, we always wanted to come down here, but we didn't uh, know that we were allowed to do that because our, our parents and our grandparents said we couldn't come to these sites anymore. And so starting to uh, share these places again with our, with our elders and the stories and the relationships that they had with these places was, 
really intriguing and important and, and for me and others uh, that uh, get to listen and partake in these, these uh, traveling experiences. Because once the elders became comfortable in the settings about the second or third time we visited these areas and they knew they could go visit them um, anytime they wanted to after that, they started sharing stories about the what had been handed down to them, the, the, the utilization, the travel to that area, the season that they use the area, always in relationship to the buffalo and uh, the plants that were available. And so that was that was some of the things that um, that I really enjoyed uh, uh, learning from the elders and in, in, in helping them better understand, yes, we can go visit these places again. But while all this was going on in the 1990s, there's reference by, I believe it was Norma, to the, to the Reagan era of uh, Reagan administration. Something happened to our, uh, to a area that's very sacred and important to me and where I grew up as a young boy, it was my classroom, it was my laboratory, it's where my grandparents took me and taught me a lot. Uh, during the Reagan era, they opened that area up to Badger 2 Medicine, the oil and gas development, and bid out all these leases. And so that fight was going on uh, and really took stride in the 1990s. And so a lot of these things were unfolding the good, the, the relationships, revisiting places, the reconnecting was happening, and also the, the hard side of things of battling the the uh, development of oil and gas in the Badger 2 medicine. But as, as things would progress, move on, uh, I was fortunate enough to go to a, a tribal college down, uh, down in uh, Arizona. And it was a four day, four day conference there. And we were, USDA was uh, talking about uh, the benefits of being a land grant institution, which all the tribal colleges get to be in 1994. And of course, USDA is always talking, was always talking at us instead of us talking to us in, in back and forth dialogue. But one of the things that kind of caught my attention after sitting and listening so much to being talked at was two elderly gentlemen that was there every day they were there every day for the, the meeting. They didn't engage in any of the meetings or, or the dialogue, but they just sat there and observed. And the fourth day when the meeting was wrapping up, they, uh, they sig signaled uh, for me to come over and visit with them. And so I went over and I sat down and, and uh, uh, talked with them a little bit. And they said, we want to share, share a story with you. And I said, sure. Uh, they said we we um, we met one, one of uh, your tribal people that used to go to this art school down here in Sippy, and we gave him some songs. We gave some songs back to back to him, and so I I didn't quite figure out what they were talking about, but they said when your people used to come down here a long time ago and visit us, the Hopi tribe and the other tribes down here in Mexico and Arizona and other, that area said, we used to exchange songs, we used to exchange ceremonial uh, activities. And so the song that we, we wanna share with you is a song that was, has been handed down uh, through their families to, the, to these two elderly gentlemen that were talking with me. So they, they shared the song with, uh, with me and, and uh, they said, we want you to bring this back, back home because this was left down here for so many generations, we want you to bring it back to your people. And fortunately, they did uh, teach one of the uh, our Blackfeet art students that was down there. And so the reason I go and share that story with you is, is our people had that ability to commute, navigate, exchange um, ways and, and learn about each other and just had a, a good relationship with uh, the brothers and sisters that, and, and, and all things in general. And when we start getting put on reservations, offenses start coming up, uh, other regulations and ways of life start being imposed on us. It, um, it was very difficult. 
and and so one of the things that it motivated, motivated me to do um, was to help begin starting some type of a national organization that would address um, some of the knowledge and some of the experiences that people had across the United States and in, in their own respective ways and in practices. So we, we started what we call the Indian Nations Conservation Alliance. And I remember um, when we started the organization in 2001, uh, officially in 2002, um, we met with a lot of tribes with, I think, 18 conservation districts at that time. And they said, we need a national voice. We formed the Indian Nations Conservation Alliance. And I believe it was in 2009 or right around that time frame, we were asked to go to Alaska. And I was asked to do a cultural sensitivity training for USDA uh, officials up there. And when I went and did, uh, did some of the cultural sensitivity training for USDA field staff office people. There were some of the, the uh, Eskimos and, and natives from Alaska that were in attendance. And they, they were really interested in learning about how to establish their own conservation districts within the boroughs up there in the different respective areas of Alaska. And so, Anyway, we helped them form uh, conservation districts up there, and and uh, they were they are our biggest success story. A lot of the women and children took the practices of the old ways of of uh, of not harvesting areas and and replanting willows for for moose and and creating their own little uh, hunting regulations for for for. Um, restoring uh, moose back into their natural calving areas. So a lot of these success stories was, were really, uh, really motivating for me to keep going in. So those are, were, that's part of kind of like what I did uh, at that with the United Nations Conservation Alliance and getting a little more education myself about uh, other tribes, indigenous people's relationship with the place. But coming back to um, when I, left the college in 2016, I ran for council. And one of the things while I was successful, I guess you could say, of getting on council, but one of the challenges at that time, another administration came on board in 2016, and that was a Trump administration. And when a Trump administration came on, um, <clears throat> when we would go back to DC to talk about Badger Two Medicine, the monuments, we were kind of discouraged about talking too much about um, any relationships or partnerships that we had with our NGO uh, partners. It was really, it was, it was a, kind of like a dark time for us. As tribes, as tribes uh, we know that relationships go beyond our four-legged, our plants, our animals, it's relationships with other groups of people that have a common interest. And so for me as a elected official, uh, serving as the vice chairman of our tribe, to hear government people tell me, you, you, you know, you don't bring their interests to the table. I said, well, their interests aren't are our interests. They're the support we, we were trying to accomplish. And so that was a really difficult time for us, but while all this was transpiring and, and Leroy brought it up, uh, you know, the Indian initiative was going strong. So we started um, um, as a tribal government, start pushing for it to, to designate areas of the reservation um, just for wildlife populations only. And I was, um, I didn't get reelected in 2020, but the momentum continue to set these areas of the reservation side uh, for wildlife populations, Buffalo, adjacent to Glacier National Park, adjacent to the International Boundary and the International Peace Park. And I share this with you because I was just told this yesterday by one of our sitting councilmen that the tribe took by resolution, took action to set 
a part of the reservation aside that's very critical for wildlife or buffalo. We look at a transboundary um, area that, that they're just gonna let and leave designated as wildlife friendly in, in, in the travel when they want, where they want, and, and uh, we'll see how that plays out. But the tribe just took that action, but it was on momentum that was started. And, and I, know, I know I'm jumping around here, skipping around here a lot, but I have a lot that I'd like to share with you. Um, so moving forward, I'm hoping that our tribe now can take, we have two herds of buffalo that, that um, we use. One is our, one is a herd that came back from Elk Island. Has a, there's a long story behind that. The, there's the, the genetic integrities there. Uh, that's the herd we hope to release back into the wild and, and, uh, and they develop their own migration patterns and territory, the territory and, and all those things that these need for their, their, their uh, well being. We have another herd that's more of a service herd for our people that is, is more managed, but maybe at some point in time they can be released too. But with all the um, effort behind what we started with the Eden Initiative that uh, Leroy talked about, one of the things that we had to do as individuals is make a, a promise to an empty chair that Leroy set beside him as a facilitator. And each one of us in that room after the elders spoke had to make a commitment to that empty chair where he and the buffalo sat. And so one of the, um, when it came to my turn to uh, talk about my commitment of, of uh, what I was going to do to help with the buffalo and and uh, get its old way of life back, so it could travel, like we used to travel to Mexico, we used to travel into Canada, take those boundaries away. I made a commitment uh, to do what I could while I served on council. I did uh, made that commitment, regardless if I was on council, not to continue that work, and I still do that today. And so, I just. Uh, I just want to share that with you. I made that commitment, and 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 uh, I uh, can only say that those that were in the room with us, that Leroy was facilitating, all made that same commitment. We be, we uh, continue to support the any initiative, the the movement of the animal across the, the boundary because it represent it represents more than um, to me. It represents. Uh, the freedom it re represents, the ability to trade, the commerce, the the songs, the stories, the education that goes along with all of these things that uh, has been missing for so long. And the reason I shared that story about the the two elderly Hopi gentlemen with uh, that shared the song with me, that's in uh, Arizona, is because. Maybe at some point in time, uh, the buffalo will have that same ability to not only cross the Canadian US border like we do as transboundary, but at some point in time, migrate back down to Mexico. Because if you look at buffalo in the subspecies of buffalo, they were all of these United States in the Eastern part, the Southern part, and the Western part, the Northern part of course, in the continent basically. And, uh, Maybe at some point in time that dream can be realized uh, with uh, continued commitment and follow through by those of us that uh, dedicate this way of life. So I want to end there and uh, hope I didn't confuse you all too much. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much for that wisdom and that, those perspectives. So for those of you who are participants, you might want to stand up and stretch. We are going to keep going, and I know panelists. And if you didn't see my note, you can hop. You know, anytime you need to use the washroom or uh, get drink, please do. 
Um, I want to give you as panelists the opportunity to ask each other questions and audience, please do type in any questions or comments that you would like to share with this panel in the meantime, and I will get to them. So panelists, do you have questions for each other? I think um, I have a maybe a comment and sort of going into a question maybe. I really like all the panelists discussion. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to see the big circle um, that's taking place of young people and elders getting together on the on the, with the for the Arc National Wildlife Refuge that really, really is awesome. And um, Carl, in your discussion about the possibility of, um, you know, and new PX and which in really working together and then Leroy your talk about um, um, you know we should just get rid of those boundaries and stuff and um, you know many times we wish we could just do that but it's just it's they're just boundaries that are there and uh, but our caribou and it's free roaming the buffalo is free roaming it's lot they're still they're still doing that they don't respect those boundaries at all um, so right now across Canada, and um, I, we know that there's a lot of land that's being recommended to be preserved under the indigenous protected and conserved areas. And also land guardianship is also growing across Canada. And I think that um, it, it, there's a great possibility here if we could bring two nations together and create an indigenous protected area between the Inupiaq, the Kuchin on both sides of the border and uh, utilize that place in a way that the young people like Mita and them have done, went to the Arctic Refuge. Like I've been there a couple of times in um, such a sacred place and it's, it's a, it, it needs that now. I just had a, some really not very good news not too long ago that the the caribou in the world after being here a million years are now headed to extinction. So by these are from scientists all over the world, I guess. And um, so there's a sense of urgency here to sense from what the elders are saying and, and, and uh, what we need to do. Um, so I think uh, the more we create an indigenous protected area and the areas of the, port, the, the caribou herd and, and the Arctic refuge where all the birds from all over the world come and have their young one is, is the place to make an indigenous protected area that's transnational. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Thoughts, Mita, Carlin? I, I'm looking to Carlin. Yeah, no, that's great, Norma. And we, uh, we're excited to see where the conversations go and and uh, looking you know beyond boundaries and beyond lines and you're right about the sense of urgency we don't have a lot of time um, when you attend international arctic meetings and they've changed the wording from climate change to climate crisis and when you see what's really happening in the arctic um, we've ran out of time a long time ago and the negative adverse cumulative impacts on our animals and wildlife and our relatives because of this um, we, we really can't wait any longer i was just reading again today a massive unknown mortality event of birds on the bering strait region where i grew up and uh, it's almost like clockwork every year at a certain time you you start reading about these things again and and uh, we're not uh, coming together fast enough to find the solution that we need uh, to, to stop it or to help, help Mother Earth heal. Um, Mother Earth is sick and we all know that. Uh, and we need to come together as relatives of, and, and uh, figure out our differences and start working together quicker. Other comments on that or other uh, questions or comments among the panelists to each other? Hmm. 
All right, um, I'm going to go to the first question that I see in the uh, chat, which is our current international governance structures have been in place since World War II, and of course much earlier with respect to so many broken treaty, treaty obligations with the U.S. Indigenous peoples. Do you as, pe as speakers have recommendations about how to improve these relationships, especially when considering the loss of biological diversity and global environmental change? Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I think that question came from Brian. Thank you for that question. I think that um, uh, the loss of biodiversity and climatic changes within our country is absolutely like really, really moving and it's all over the world. I mean, we could just see it from the fires and floods and, and everything. And I was up at the, on the caribou grounds about two weeks ago. Um, and I was, I could, I picked berries on the tundra and that tundra you see in the back there along the Dempster highway and uh, where the caribou come, this is part of their, their wintering lands. They come here. Um, and uh, the, the, the land was so dry. There's four rivers there. All of them you could walk across. The land was so dry. I could crawl around on my knees and pick berries. And then there's fires around us. Um, this is within the caribou range. Um, so, you know, I, I, like I, I have hope. We have to keep going with hope and, um, and move forward to, to really, really look at protecting those lands. And I think that's, that's really important. And uh, we did talk about, um, I did say indigenous protected areas earlier. I mean, there's, I, I can't see any other way to go than to create more treaties and, and things like that. Um, um, like um, Leroy had said that, the, and then, and Brian, you also said these treaties are broken all the time. But I think we just need to move with the caribou as long as it survives to stay with it and hold it up. And when we're out there on the land with the animals, with our boots on the ground as guardians and stewards that we always been for thousands of years, the animals seem to rejuvenate. They like it when we're there, if we don't hurt them. So they wake up, it seems, when we go home to our homelands. Um, so, yeah. Do others want to comment on that as well? Leroy, did you want to comment on that or are you just unmuting? I was just unmuting. Okay. But let me let me comment. Okay. Um, the reason, the reason for the um, broken treaties is because if we can use and refer to the notion of science, see, when our elders talk about our life ways, they're really talking about a lived science. In other words, indigenous science is a lived science, okay? Western science, which is largely based on the notion of measurement, is not a lived science. It's not a lived science. It's it's all propositional. Mm -hmm. Whereas indigenous science is based on this lived way. It is all about relationships. Okay. So coming back to the notion about those metaphysics, which I didn't go into, but mentioned, is that one of the major and important aspects of those metaphysics is that in Western thought, 
Time is a major aspect of Western metaphysics. And when you really look at time per se, it's not related to the land. It's not about, you know, the environment or anything. See, whereas when you look at the native metaphysics, relationships are very important. That's one of the foundational basis. And so when you're talking relationships, yeah, it's my relationship to those animals out there and so on. And that's kind of those that big difference. And so when we're talking about broken treaties, it all comes back to those metaphysics because it's really not about they don't look at those treaties as true relationships because they're coming from a time perspective. Thank you. So maybe um, uh, something riffing off of that. Um, I had heard once in the Bison treaties that um, treaties are interpreted in the Western sense as a piece of paper and a static agreement and um, trees amongst indigenous peoples are about ongoing dialogues. Would someone want to expand a little bit on what that, about that, what that means? And is that, is that a correct perception that I'm presenting? Yeah. yeah. The, the explanation I give is, and the analogy I draw is like a man and a woman coming together and getting married, okay? And they go through the wedding, you know, celebration and so on. Okay, well, the wedding is really the treaty, okay? But as you live together over many years, you end up saying, okay, how are we going to raise the kids? Is one of us going to stay at home, look after the kids? Are both of us going to, you know, work or what? What do you know? How are we going to support ourselves? All those kind of things come in. See, so the treaty is just the beginning of the relationship. And, but the rest of the, your lives together really develops. It's an ongoing relational development. Well, that's how we look at treaties. We entered into treaties and signing on the treaty wasn't the, wasn't the end of things. It was just the beginning, see? And the Western world kind of forgets about that. It's kind of saying, okay, now we're married. You go your own way. I'll go play golf with the boys. See? So that's the difference these different worldviews give you about things such as legal aspects. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other comments on treaty before I go to the next question all right just, oh, go ahead please okay i just wanted to um, build upon also what um, mita has said earlier about how um you know during the 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 whole this whole work with the caribou the environmentalists our allies were absolutely a major part of where we are today in fighting to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And they brought their hearts and souls to protect wilderness. And, and, and they work very, very hard along with us. And our elders told us, walk beside them. We talk about your human rights and, you know, and work together. They're, they're gonna talk about wilderness and the beauty and things like that. You bring your human rights issues to the spectrum. And um, 
um, and I and Lee are always saying that you know the, the Western science and 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 um, and our science, our ancient science, that we go back like I don't know, it's all kinds of numbers, fifty thousand years ago, maybe when the caribou was here. So like you know, we it's all kinds of numbers that are out there, but we we were here a long time, so we know everything about our lands, and we know we got we have that knowledge. What we want to do now, because the young people like Mita and Carlin, you know, they want to work together with allies. They want to work together and walk this world together. And a lot of non-Indigenous young people out there are just wanting to work and learn from Indigenous elders because they're starting to see that science is, is minute. It's just a very small part of dissecting something, one thing, whereas we come from a very ecosystems approach. And that um, I, I'm part of, I'm really happy to be part of an entity, the Canadian Mountain Network, that has opened up that opportunity for Western and research and Indigenous research to work together in, in, in doing, re look at caribou, look at salmon, look at um, other things that are um, important to them. And uh, we really need to embrace that, that the, the younger and the non-Indigenous peoples, we need to bring them in or work together somehow and make it all happen. And because we're not the only ones in jeopardy here, it's the whole planet and they are concerned. And I, the more they learn from our elders like Leroy and Terry and, and you know ourselves, then the stronger they will become for the future. The resiliency needs to be built there, like right away as well. Again, that's a sense of urgency. So we need also need to do that. And I think it's very important. Thank you. And I want to just note both to the panelists and to uh, people who are listening to this, there's a great discussion between Jermaine and uh, Anne Mayo and Brian Housel and others on this going on on the side as well. Uh, so please do check in with that. Um, this question might be Terry for you uh, from Christiane Art Artuso, which is, uh, what are the stages in the plan for the eventual release and reestablishment of the wild wild herd of any bison or buffalo? What might be the steps to uh, establish an indigenous protected area with a wild herd of bison across the 49th parallel? So what, what is it going to take going forward? I could probably answer part of that. Um, well, one of the things that we did early on with uh, the Indian Initiative was was just taking hold because we did community surveys, getting social surveys to get uh, get the I guess opinions and thoughts about from community of of uh, what they wanted to see on landscape and. 80% of the residents on the Blackfeet Nation wanted to see buffalo back on landscape. But because of our land ownership, we have um, multiple different types of ownership here, uh, tribal trust, uh, uh, individual trust property, fee, and it's kind of a checkerboard land status. That, has been hindering some of that process. Uh, with the Cabell settlement going forward and some of the fractionated interest bought out to uh, consolidate the, a lot of the properties in the uh, we call the Nastako area, Chief Mountain area, where the where it's the buffalo and wildlife, I don't know if we, we want to call it a refuge or sanctuary, whatever we end up calling it. Uh, happens, uh, the tribe has majority interest in that particular property now. But in the, with social survey supporting interest of that area, the, the steps to, to um, getting the release have, were started about 10 years ago. And that was doing social surveys and meeting with community and, and getting uh, support from governance and it's probably taken us, uh, you know, at least 10 years to get to the resolution of setting that land uh, adjacent to the border and to the Glacier House Park side. And right, probably the next steps will be to release uh, some of the animals up there could happen within the next two or three years in this area of the 
Blackfeet Indian Reservation. And once they're released into the wild, uh, uh, you know, they're considered wildlife. We, in 2017, we took action as tribal governance to designate this Ine herd, as we're calling it, the Elk Island herd, as wildlife. And so once they're back into the landscape, instead of falling under a under a buffalo, a Blackfeet Buffalo program, they'll fall under our Blackfish, Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife program. So they'll just be uh, just like the elk, the moose, the deer, the grizzly bear, the wolf, the wolverine. We have all that stuff here. And so you know, just they'll be part of that landscape. And, and uh, if they migrate into Canada, that's their choice. <laughs> and we'll see what happens up there and how they, they adjust to it and how the tribes support having them back into Canada. And, We'll do our continue to do our uh, work down here to hopefully grow that area and and uh, create something along the Rocky Mountain front for. Yeah, you you all have been negotiating a lot of boundaries. I know Jeff Mao is on this call. He's the superintendent of Glacier National Park, and he's really excited as well. From my understanding of seeing bison and you know uh, moving into the park into. Waterton and of course up into the Kainai land that uh, Leroy spoke a little bit about. Um, any other comments, Leroy or Terry, before I move to the next question? Yeah, on the Canadian side, we are, we've got tribal lands there adjacent to Waterton Lakes National Park. And as between Waterton Lakes and Glacier International, uh, Glacier Park in Montana, hey, they've got this Waterton Lakes Glacier International Peace Park, okay? And both parks are very interested in bringing buffalo into their parks and so on. And we see that as a natural for transboundary, for uh, traffic by buffalo you know, across the border. And so, and in fact, complements uh, Yellowstone to Yukon corridor for other animals up the eastern front of the Rockies going uh, northward and so on. And we're also talking about starting um, intertribal herds on both sides of the uh, border, you know, but out onto the plains, but having, you know, cooperation between those intertribal herds once they're established and so on, back and forth, because a government uh, project study known as the Bison Conservation Initiative included, included herds from both sides of the border. So talk about cross boundary notions. And the whole idea that I think our governments especially have to realize is that by having, you know, cross border traffic it gives us an opportunity to cooperate and work together. It's kind of like, hey, COVID-19 doesn't, doesn't, doesn't you know, respect the border, but if we worked together as nations, you know, I think we will be able to solve the problem much faster and easier. You know, that's what our governments need to realize. Yeah. All right. Um, on this, uh, oh yes, please, Mita. Thank you. Um, I I feel a little intimidated because this panel are my elders and have spent their lives working on this. So please forgive me if I make any mistakes. It's not my intention to offend anybody. Um, so just listening to Leroy, I love the conversation with boundaries because it um, makes me think about one of my dear mentors who has recently passed, Dr. Rita Bubenstein. Uh, she is 
Yupik and one of the 13 indigenous grandmothers. And one of the things that um, she told me early on was when we're looking at, at climate change and, and I've been blessed actually with the ability of um, receiving stories from elders and medicine people in Alaska and Canada on the lower 48. Um, and in those stories, you know, there's this understanding that we're transitioning and we're not gonna go all the way back to pre-contact the way it was, right? So we have to do the best that we can to help um, our relatives, the caribou and the buffalo and plants and animals to transition and also to um, do the work so that we don't warm up too fast. Like we were just talking about that, that finite area that where we can exist, we have to kind of rein it back in of the um, damage that we've done. But within this transformational context, uh, Dr. Rita Blumenstein would talk about how we have to start working to bringing up um, species. And she's in particular talking about plants from the regions below us that are these kind of foundational species. And I've heard this echoed by other, other elders and within the context of this conversation here recently, there's been in the adaptation region of thought, this uh, bringing back our Buffalo, right? We had Buffalo with them Buffalo and we already have um, a couple of herds, but looking at our permafrost and getting heavy herbivores back on our permafrost so that we can compact it and actually lock up that permafrost and keep it from thawing quickly, which keeps that, um, keeps the earth cooler. It also keeps the carbon in, keeps fresh water in, keeps methane in. And so looking at our buffalo relatives and actually their ability to even help caribou relatives, right? That interconnectivity mm -hmm. and that crossing of boundaries. And this conversation is so powerful. Um, and one of the things, you know, for calling on our governments and, and all of the amazing people listening to this conversation, that relationship with the land, that knowledge of the animals and the plants is intrinsic in our ability to survive as human beings. And so within Rita's conversation of bringing plants up, you don't just pick whatever plants you want to bring up, you know, just because somebody at DOT wants to test bird vetch or something crazy. You have to go and talk to your relatives, right? We have to go talk to our trade partners. And, you know, we're in South Central area here in Denina lands, but also go down and talk to South, people in Southeast. You know, what are your cornerstone plants? Which plants play well with other plants? You know, which ones are going to be these cornerstone species? And uh, the Kenai Peninsula, is gonna transition back to prairie lands and it will be a place for buffalo and prairie again. So what are those cornerstone prairie plant species that need to come in to support the buffalo relatives? And these are the kind of the larger conversations that we're going to need to start broaching uh, more intentionally and, and rather quickly. So thank you for sharing. Goodness, Thank you, Mita. And I would share that it's this is quite an intimidating uh, panel to tr to facilitate, and I too um, am doing my best. So I apologize if I um, inadvertently misspeak, because um, you you guys are an impressive. It's just so thrilling to be here. Um, I'm going to move us on to a comment by Brian, who said one of our experts. So one of you all stated, the land doesn't belong to us, we belong to the land. Um, and he said, thank you for stating that basic problem, an Anglo concept of private property. And it's so hard to unravel it. Um, and I guess I would um, maybe take that a bit further and say, you know, in Canada, um, um, we, we see such a huge movement towards um, indigenous led protected areas, IPCAs um, and the like. And in, in the U.S. there's some of that, but um, I think it's still coming. Like, for example, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, bison range in uh, on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Reservation was recently turned over to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai. Um, 
but how, how do we, how do we deepen that? How do we broaden that? And how do we really make that happen, particularly in the challenge where we have two different federal governments across one traditional territory? What is, what are your thoughts? Easy question. Well, I think one of the things that uh, um, that is really interesting with the, with the existing leadership in both countries right now, uh, with Biden, thank God he's there now, um, and uh, and Trudeau, and we're in elections now in Canada. Um, however, there's a real need right now internationally as well that's going to be talked at uh, the next. Climate, big climate, international climate change conference that's coming up here. That um, that we need to work really hard at conserving areas. And if these people, these leaders, are really, really um, uh, wanting to, or or um, listening, or want to move forward in some kind of protection of large areas, I think. Um, the, the opportunity is now like we need to we need, really need to push that um and to protect biodiversity because you know we're not in a very good place we need to start protecting as much of those um those areas as we possibly can and there's dialogue between the two governments but we don't know what's going to happen in canada right now um but there has been discussion on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is huge. That has not happened in many, many years. Um, so, you know, we, you know, I think opportunities are open now for uh, Indigenous peoples to really step up and push to protect these areas. I think you're, you're with a majority of 60 different countries in the world are pledging to getting to at least 30% protected areas uh, by 3030 as a step towards what nature needs. Great to hear you reinforcing that. Other thoughts on that? One of the things the Imago Initiative is trying to do is to um, work with individuals and folks in the communities to determine what they would like. So in addition to the Biden administration moving forward with government to government consultation and things like that, uh, we're also trying to take a grassroots approach to determine uh, solutions from, from local folks with input and guidance from partners. And uh, that's a long journey. and. Uh, uh, I still can't believe we're talking to all of you today about the Imago Initiative. Uh, two years ago, I, when we were talking about it, I would get uh, two weeks of calls after this, after we hang up, I'd get two weeks of calls from, from folks saying, hey, what are you trying to do? Get rid of Big W Wilderness and things like this. And, and just having to spend one to two hours on the phone with folks from across the country to explain that that's not what we're trying to do. And that... Uh, we are mindful that in the past conservation groups and others may have been prescriptive in solutions that may have not been grassroots. But one thing we're trying to do here is to ensure that uh, the voice of the people that are impacted the most is heard and that ideas generated that may become solutions uh, come from uh, indigenous people most impacted as well. And it's a long journey and uh, some of our Key strategies have been quiet diplomacy, uh, drinking a lot of tea and coffee. Our first trip into the refuge on the Imago Initiative, there was two of us went to Koktovik and, uh, and drank a lot of coffee and a lot of tea and just listened. And then that led to the second trip where there's eight of us. And then this third trip where we had 22 uh, indigenous and, and conservation partners. So we're building on a scaffolding approach to try to get to uh, a great solution. Looking at what all of um, folks before us have done, Norma and others in Canada with the IPCAs and looking at Brazil and Australia and uh, our, our relatives
relatives in in uh, Alti and Chukotka in Russia, and to see what what worked the best, what didn't, what are lessons learned, uh, but then also bringing the conversations to the Arctic here, and uh, see see what folks can come up with here for for new solutions and being creative and open minded in in the sense that we don't have to do what's always been there. Let, let's think outside of the box and be creative while also respecting the legacy of, of Big W Wilderness and what our, our elders have created for us in the Wonderful. indigenous world and conservation, sorry. Oh, no, it's, sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I love this government to government to government. So indigenous governments too, but also what you're what you say, Carlin, and, and that work of Imago so reminds me that intact, where indigenous cultures are intact, there's um, a, a strong association with intact nature. No surprise given what you all are talking about today. Um, diving a little bit deeper into this this um, Jeff Mao wanted to thank you all um, for sharing your stories and and wanted to hear a little bit more about um, the the INI initiative, which um, and I and I know this from some of the meetings I've been part of. Um, beyond just uh, the, the INI and the return of bison, what are some of the other components of the larger INI initiative around culture and restoration of peoples? And while you ponder that, Terry and Leroy, um, I'm just gonna let people know that after this, I'll give you all a chance to have uh, uh, some last words and thoughts of things that you haven't shared, and then um, we'll move to closure. So back to you, Leroy and Terry, what are some of those other pieces of the INI initiative? Go ahead, Terry. Okay, I always defer to Leroy as my elder, but uh, since he let me let me speak first. One of the one of the things that we face as a confederacy is the the ability to go back and forth for ceremony for social events. Um, if somebody has maybe gotten in some type of trouble in the states and they can't go into Canada and. And so just having that access to go back and forth to, to see relatives, to participate in ceremony, to reconnect. And for us in the, uh, in the that are US citizens of the Amscopi Bikini, one of the things that um, we really need to build upon is the language. There are uh, fluent speakers in Canada. There are some down here, but we have lost a lot. In, to maintain and sustain the language is critical of the ceremonies and all those practices. But just to remember who our relatives are up there and all the stories that are, are that connect us as a people, um, that's that's so, so critical in our old ways of healing and, and dealing with adversity. Uh, those were kind of broken too when the uh, when the medicine line was put in there, as they call it. But uh, just that reconnecting in our in our true and old ways of practicing of who we are as people. Yeah. The, um, all the ideas that came from our Buffalo dialogues that were uh, brought about by the INI initiative are captured in the Buffalo Treaty. And that Buffalo Treaty, for instance, speaks to conservation, keeping in mind that, hey, you can, we can talk about Buffalo, we can talk about fish and so forth, and our relationship with them. But if there's no fish, if there's no Buffalo and so on, what good is that, say? And so it speaks to conservation, in other words, maintaining that relationship, looking after the buffalo, looking after the fish, and so on, that relationship. It speaks to culture, in other words, how we fit into the overall picture, and so on. The treaty spoke 
speaks to, you know, issues like education, because we want to hand down the things Terry is speaking about down to our younger generation, because that's what education is all about, handing down our knowledge down to the younger generations, our songs, our stories, our ceremonies, the knowledge that we have, it's passing them on down. Okay. It speaks to health because, hey, health is something that, you know, our people, not just physical, but mental health and so on. When we have the good relationship with the totality of the environment, hey, health is going to, you know, reign amongst our members of the society. And of course, the notion of exchange, if you want to say economics. Yeah, we, as some of our presenters talked about, hey, we had exchanges and so on. Terry said, hey, we used to go way down there to the south the Southwest to exchange. And it wasn't just goods we exchanged. We exchanged songs and stories and so forth. And in today's world, because we never know what the future is going to bring, we always have to be ready. So research is something that the treaties also speaks to. This all comes from the discussions brought about by the ENI initiative. Those are captured in the Buffalo Treaty. So that's why the Buffalo Treaty is a very important uh, agreement amongst all the signatories that have signed on to the treaty and all the individual supporters and NGOs that have signed on to the treaty. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so I wanna give each of you panelists an opportunity um, to, to speak your mind. I have a suggestion from one of the last questions from Karen Beasley, which is about her own struggle with being resilient. And, and if you want to speak to this, please feel free, but what are your insights on remaining resilient and hopeful for the future? And I invite any of you to speak. I guess I'll take first cut out that. And I, I did that in my intro, my reason for being resilience is behind me. Right now they're in school, but it's my children and grandchildren. And I think the more I stay engaged and involved and, and uh, share with them why it's important, uh, that's all the motivation I need for resiliency right there because that's something that I hope that they pick up, continue on. And in our family, it's been a practice. Once the children reach around eight or nine years old, they go back into the Badger's Medicine Camp, horseback, pack all our bedding, food, and stay there for days and uh, learn that understanding and appreciation of the place and what it has to offer you um, spiritually and in the strength that you receive from that. So resiliency for me is just continuing on because I want them to, to understand the importance and continue it. I get lazy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, add my two cents. And that is the road to resilience is your indigenous languages because it's in those languages that we think, you know, in and through. We, we think through those languages. And those languages act as a, 
repository for all the knowledge that we have. So Blackfoot, you know, Gwich'in, you know, Cree, and so on are, you know, are really the shortcut towards traditional knowledge and a shortcut to resilience. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think uh, Leroy uh, like touched on this a lot is that, um, you know, I think our, our young people, we just need to join up with them. Um, no matter of what race we need to um, work with them in many, in any way that we possibly can in teaching and educating and sharing um, and, and to like our strongest ways of surviving is to share with each other and to be grateful for everything and every day. Like even that shower you jump in this morning, how many of us give thanks for the water? Because water is scarce mm -hmm. on Mother Earth now. Those sacred entities that are, that are happening and the respect for the disease and the respect for what's coming and just to respect it and try and work with it and um, be strong uh, together. And to, I think when we love our land so much and we love our ancestors so much, um, that that love needs to go, keep on going for everything, for, for each other and to strengthen each other by growing those relationships with no matter who's around you. And yes, our languages, all our, our culture and everything lies within our languages. And young people need to learn those languages, no matter what color or you are either, you know, like we, I, I'd love to learn other people's languages too. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just, you know, try to work together forward. Um, and uh, learn our history and our culture. Know, learn about why it is that indigenous peoples who are here on this mother earth, on this continent here, hundreds or thousands of years ago, how we survived, learn and all the histories of the residential school and like learn about that. Try to understand why it is that whatever is left now is so sacred and so important to us that we have to do everything in our power to protect it. And we can't do it ourselves. We have to, we have to work together. In historical times, many of our people were jailed and massacred and executed for fighting for mother earth, for fighting for water so that it wouldn't be here today like this. You know, what's left, we still, we, we have hope. We, we just need to do it together now. And, and you have a voice, the creator gave you a voice, speak out, speak out in a good way and, and um, speak, speak about mother earth because she's all we got and talk about her with compassion and love and caring and concern and, uh, and you know, move forward in that way. I just wanna give some real kudos to the, some people and I have this book here that tells, I don't know if you can see it, but tells the whole story of the, the whole plight on the caribou. And this one little man, that Jewish man that came to us, I took him to my homelands. His name was Lenny Combe. And he wanted to take my picture. And I said, well, you can't just take my picture because you're just gonna leave anyways. And what are you gonna do? And I said, if you wanna really learn about our people, and why don't you come to my village? And I took him there and he stayed with us on our lands. And he, he was an incredible person through this many years of our fight for our lands in the Arctic refuge for the calving grounds and very key. Our, my mom called him the little man that never sleeps because <laughs> he'd take pictures all, all night and stuff like that. And uh, everything is documented in this book. And I think we have a visual of it. And, I just want to just say thank you to the panelists and for everybody who joined us today. 
um, there's a there's a lot of hope out there. So we just need to embrace it and move forward in in this kind of kindness for each other, nations to nations, and really use your voice in a good way and a respectful way. It's been an honor to sit with you people and haven't seen Leroy for a long time. It's good to see you. Good to see the young people. And Terry, thank you so much. Yeah. Good to see you and all my. All right. Would anyone else like to say anything else before we go? Um, yeah, I would just like to kind of speak to that that concept of resilience as well, and just from another framework. You know, it's a lot of times in the sense of withstanding uh, stress and trauma, being resilient to adverse things, and if we undo that, you know, what is a trauma? It's a unmitigated stress, and so we have to really start looking at kind of our foundational aspects of what helps us to be strong and what helps us to be healthy. And we heard from Leroy and Terry and Norma on, you know, our language and our culture. And we also need to refer to, you know, like our traditional cultural values and, and our leadership. You know, we made sure that people had clean water, made sure that they had food to eat, made sure that they had to rest, made sure that they had good work to do. And coming back into balance, remembering that we're human, we're, we're, you know, we're not outside of these rules. We're not super or above. We have to conform to these rules and, you know, transition that thought from self-care into um, really being realistic in what this biosphere needs and what we need. And healing is a major part of the traditional stories in moving forward. So healing ourselves internally and being realistic with ourselves and what we need. And then that also translates into our behaviors as they manifest outwards to other groups. And so I'd like everybody to carry with them that just slow down, you know, what do we need to care for ourselves and for our families and our communities and um, be realistic in this transformational process. Goodness to all of you for sharing your thoughts and wisdom and for allowing me to be in this space with you. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to echo what the panelists said and, and thank you all for allowing me to be here with you as well and, and Jody for uh, hosting us and being a great uh, moderator. Um, we spend a lot of time every day in, in our campaigns and coalitions and fighting to protect Mother Nature. And when I, we were in the Arctic refuge laying on the ground and, and uh, uh, getting energy from, from the earth, I was reminded that uh, Mother Nature is protecting us as well. Um, we talk about uh, climate mitigation using sequestration properties of the earth and all of these other things. And, and uh, we get our food, our shelter and everything from Mother Earth and clean water, clean air. And so just that, uh, that uh, realization and reminder that um, Mother Earth is taking care of us too, and, uh, and which is one reason why we have a reciprocal responsibility to take care of, of Mother Earth. Um, but also laying there in the refuge and looking at the, the wolves and the caribou and the grizzly bears, I was also thinking that Fish and wildlife and the agencies are able to protect this place and these resources because of the great job our ancestors did. Our, our people have been stewards of the land since time immemorial for since millennia. And because they did such a great job and not only here in the Arctic in the US but our, our Canadian relatives, if you know, it's like a bailment when, when the animals cross uh, we're counting on you to take care of the resources you're counting on us. And so it was uh, that realization that uh, these resources are only here today because of the great stewardship that our ancestors did uh, back long ago. And we need to listen to the indigenous people and include them in that stewardship today. And so 
that's very important. And also I, I'm always inspired by the paradigm shift that I'm seeing within conservation groups and the government, even though it's slow and not as fast as I'd like, uh, that inspires me to be resilient, that people are listening, people are wanting to change, and people are looking to indigenous people for leadership to do things in a good way going forward. So, Kuyana Puck. Thank you all. I want you to know, panelists, that there are a lot of personal messages in the chat to you per individuals personally and overall there's a huge amount of gratefulness that i'm seeing in there i will your i'll stay on in case you want to read them now i will also send them to you because um they really speak to um that i think that your messages are really important right now and i want to thank you on behalf of everyone for sharing your time um the issue of transboundary conservation and conservation uh, in general of people and nature um, and culture is so, so, so in, in the forefront. And I, I really do think that there's opportunity. Some of these dialogues are gonna continue on a much bigger level at the Salazar Symposium, which is at the end of September um, on a North American wide basis. So bringing in Mexico, the US and Canada and much more on a political level um, I believe some of the higher level appointees will be coming. So um, I did post um, uh, the link to that symposium there. And I want you to know that groups um, that have helped to support uh, the, the first four dialogues, like Issa Ilsek Salam, Olam, um, the Center for Landscape Conservation, the Nature Conservancy, the Boreal, uh oh, the Boreal, oh, what is Liana's? group, uh, Royal Conservation Initiative. I think I probably got that wrong. I'm so sorry, but many groups are, are supporting these dialogues. We're going to be taking this and the other dialogues and trying to pull some of the key messaging out. We'll share it back with everybody who was on this um, and uh, with the idea that if people want to message this to their politicians, to others, and um, try to change their own organizations, um, that we welcome that. So with that, I again want to thank all of you. Really an amazing, uh, amazing panel and an honor to get to be on it with you. Thank you. May you keep up the